Hi guys, Dane here. Today I'll be doing a review of Fantastic Voyage by Isaac Asimov. So this is the Corgi Science Fiction Collector's Library Edition, based on a screenplay by Harry Kleiner, uh, which was based on a story by Otto Clement and J. Lewis Bixby. And then like, Asimov basically novelised it. I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb, then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Here, for the connoisseur, for the devotee of the science fiction genre, and for those who like their reading to combine excitement with good writing, is the Corgi Science Fiction Collector's Library, a series that brings in uniform edition many of the greats of science fiction, standard classics, contemporary prize winners, and controversial fiction, fantasy, and fact. Fantastic Voyage by Isaac Asimov is the novel, based on the 20th century Fox motion picture, of a journey into a new dimension. Four men and one woman, reduced to microscopic size, are injected into the carotid artery of a dying man. Their mission? To fight their way into the cranium and destroy a blood clot. At stake, a man's life on which depends the fate of the entire world. So I haven't seen the movie of this, so all I can kind of give you so far are my thoughts on the novel, although I will be watching the movie. Um, and, I, you know, I think this is interesting because there are a whole, basically the entire plot is a cliche by this point. It's been done to death almost. Um, but I assume this is kind of where that came from. There's a lot of uh, biology to this as well, which was really interesting. Asimov's take on it was all cool as well. Obviously, I can't tell how much comes from the movie and how much is unique to Asimov, um, but we shall see. It's also very grounded in the um, sort of the paranoia of the Cold War. Um, there may be some quotes on that. I can't remember what I tabbed out. So we get this, uh, a scientist says to a woman, he says, you look tired. Cora's hand lifted halfway to her hair, for translated into the feminine, the word tired means disheveled. And so here we just get an interesting little bit of biology, but also this like, almost like a futuristic uh, drug. But I'm just going to read it out and uh, you know, you'll learn about it from there. In Michael's office, Grant found himself looking at the map of the circulatory system open mouthed. Michael said, it's an unholy mess, but it's a map of the territory. Every mark on it is a road, every junction is a crossroad. That map is as intricate as a road map of the United States, more so for it's in three dimensions. Good lord. A hundred thousand miles of blood vessels. You see very little of it now. Most of it is microscopic and won't be visible to you without considerable magnification. But put all together in a single line and it would go four times around the earth, or if you prefer, nearly halfway to the moon. Have you had any sleep, Graham? About six hours. I napped on the plane too. I'm in good shape. Good, you'll have a chance to eat and shave and tend to other such matters if necessary. I wish I had slept. He held up a hand as soon as he had said that. Not that I'm in bad shape. I'm not complaining. Have you ever taken a morphogen? Never heard of it. Is it some kind of drug? Yes, relatively new. It's not the sleep you need, you know. One doesn't rest in sleep to any greater extent than one would by stretching out comfortably with the eyes open. Less, maybe. It's the dreams we need. We've got to have dreaming time, otherwise cerebral coordination breaks down and you begin to have hallucinations and, eventually, death. The morphogen makes you dream, is that it? Exactly, it knocks you out for half an hour of solid dreaming and then you're set for the day. Take my advice though and stay away from the stuff unless it's an emergency. Why? Does it leave you tired? No, well, not particularly tired, it's just that the dreams are bad. The morphogen vacuums the mind, cleans out the mental garbage pit accumulated during the day, and it's quite an experience. Don't do it. But I had no choice. That map had to be prepared and I spent all night at it. And here again we get some interesting stuff of the biology behind all of this. So Owen says, well then, if we enter an artery, we'll be exposed to the full force of the arterial current. Not quite a mile an hour, said Carter. Never mind the miles per hour. We will be moving at about 100,000 times the length of our ship each second. That will be equivalent, under ordinary circumstances, to moving 200 miles a second or something like that. On our miniaturized scale, we'll be moving a dozen times as fast as any astronaut ever moved, at least. Undoubtedly, said Carter, but what of it? Every red blood corpuscle in the bloodstream moves as quickly, and the ship is much more sturdily built than the corpuscle. Corpus, yeah. No, it is not, said Owens passionately. A red blood corpuscle contains billions of atoms, but the Proteus will crowd billions of billions of billions of atoms into the same space. Miniaturized atoms, to be sure, but what of that? We will be made up of an immensely larger number of units than the red blood corpuscle, and will be flabbier for that reason. Furthermore, the red blood corpuscle is in an environment of atoms equal in size to those that make it up. We will be an environment made up of what will be to us monstrous atoms. Man, I wish that didn't have the word corpuscle in it so often because I don't know how to pronounce that. And someone says, do you know of any reason why she shouldn't be on board? She's a woman. She may not be reliable in emergencies. A little bit outdated there, Isaac, me old chum. And so uh, we get this while they're being miniaturized. The bottom of the miniaturizer was glowing with the colorless light that blazed without blinding. 
It did not seem to be sensed with the eyes, but with the nerves generally, so that when Grant closed his eyes, all actual objects blanked out, but the light was still visible as a general, featureless radiance. Michaels must have been watching Grant close his eyes or uselessly, for he said, It's not light. It's not electromagnetic radiation of any sort. It's a form of energy that is not part of our normal universe. It affects the nerve endings and our brain interprets it as light because it knows of no other way of interpreting it. We get this horrifying thought. C glancingly, can't stand that word. <laughs> glancingly, Carter imagined what might happen if the beam had been slightly less accurate. If half the Proteus had miniaturized rapidly while the other half, caught at the boundary of the beam, had miniaturized slowly or not at all but it hadn't happened and he strove to put it out of his mind. So this was quite a futuristic idea which may well happen one day, we'll see. Uh, we get, of course, consider the future. A ship can be sent through a clogged arterial system, loosening and detaching the sclerotic regions, breaking them up, boring and reaming out the tubes. Pretty expensive treatment, however. Maybe it could be automated eventually, said Grant. Perhaps little housekeeping robots can be sent in to clean up the mess. Or perhaps every human being in early manhood can be injected with a permanent supply of such vessel cleaners. And later on we get a um, hundred thousand miles in the unminiaturized scale. On our present scale it is, he paused to think then said, over oh, three million miles long, half a light year. To travel through every one of Benes' blood vessels in our present state would be almost the equivalent of a trip to a star. And uh, they end up having to go through the heart, so they have to stop the guy's heart so that they can travel through it. Um, and then restart it once they're through. But uh, this was interesting, it says, that muscle, the heart, was a double pump that had to beat from well before birth to the final moment before death and do so with unbroken rhythm, unwearying strength under all conditions. It was the greatest heart in the animal kingdom. The heart of no other mammal beat more than a billion times or so before even the most delayed approach of death. But after a billion heartbeats, the human being was merely in early middle age, in the prime of his strength and power. Men and women had lived long enough to experience well over three billion heartbeats. And here we get a uh, talk about like particles, because this is how small they are, so it says, in fact, you're sorry you didn't bring a hand lens. I've got news for you, Duval. You wouldn't see much. You could magnify the wave properties as well as the particle properties of atoms and subatomic particles. Anything you see, even by the reflection of miniaturized light, would be too hazy to do you much good. Corey said, is that why nothing really looks sharp? I thought it was just because we were seeing things through blood plasma. The plasma is a factor, certainly. But in addition, the general graininess of the universe becomes much larger as we become much smaller. It's like looking really closely at an old-fashioned newspaper photograph. You see the dots more clearly and it becomes hazy. And they end up in the lungs and we get, Grant said, this place is full of rocks. Dust and grit, I imagine, came Michael's voice. Dust and grit, the legacy of living in civilization, of breathing unfiltered air. The lungs are a one-way passage. We can take dust in, but there's no way of pushing it out again. And um, later on we get some kind of interesting stuff as well. Somebody like stubs his, uh, well he bangs his knee against uh, a, a speck of dust. So it kind of shows you how small they were. But yeah, Fantastic Voyage by Isaac Asimov. Very sort of thoughtful, very biology driven, um, very sciencey, very cool. I don't know, uh, as I say, how much you can attribute to Asimov and how much comes from the film, but still, I did enjoy it. I would give this a pretty strong 3.5 out of 5. Definitely check it out if, uh, if, if it sounds like something you'd be interested in. So there we have it, that's what I made of Fantastic Voyage by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.